Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's so nice to see folks from all different parts of FIT. So welcome to the Art Speak 2017-2018 lecture series, an interdisciplinary program presented by the departments of fine arts, history of art, English and communication studies, and the MFA in fashion design. Our series this year is on the theme of the creative practitioner and the expanded studio. We have invited contemporary speakers whose work has made an impact not only on art and art history, but also on other disciplines and whose approaches have changed our understanding of our different fields. Other Art Speak programming this year for our students included gallery visits and studio visits and hosting visiting artists. The artist E.J. Hauser also exhibited a collection of drawings and paintings at FIT's D6 gallery in conjunction with her campus visit. So we have this mini gallery on the sixth floor right outside the elevators. We would like to thank Troy Richards, Dean of the School of Art and Design, and Patrick Nicely, Dean of the School of Liberal Arts, for their generous support and commitment to this program, and also the Student Faculty Corporation for making this event possible. We also thank our chairs, Joel Waring, who's on a, at a SUNY conference right now, from Fine Arts, David Drogan from History of Art, Rachel Baum, Associate Chair of Art History and Museum Professions, and Amy Lemon from English and Communication Studies, and also Kyle Farmer from the MFA in Fashion Design for their support as well. Our speaker tonight is the renowned writer, art historian, and theorist, Siri Husfet. Ms. Husfet will be lecturing on one or more of the many topics that she's explored in her writing. There'll be a Q&A at the end of the lecture. And to introduce Siri, please welcome Patrick Nicely, Dean of Liberal Arts. Thank you, Julia. Uh, this is an enormous pleasure for me because I first met Siri in another lifetime when I was managing a little independent bookstore in Chelsea that's owned by Paula Cooper. And she graced us with her presence on a number of occasions. Always a spectacular evening. Um, she's the author of a, a book of poetry, three collections of essays, a work of nonfiction, six novels, uh, including the international bestsellers What I Loved and The Summer Without Men. Uh, her recent novel, The Blazing World, was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. I don't know if you all know what the Man Booker Prize is, but that's an extraordinary honor. Uh, and it won the Los Angeles Book Prize for fiction. Uh, she was awarded the International Gabarron Prize for thought and humanities. She has a PhD in English from Columbia. She's a lecturer in psychiatry at the Weill Cornell Medical College in New York. Her work has been translated into over 30 languages. She wrote a book, I love the title of A Woman Looking at Men, Looking at Women, Essays on Art, Sex, and the Mind. She was featured in the Anne Klein advertising campaign in the fall of 2017. Uh, she, she first started writing about art with a book called Mysteries of the Rectangle. And she writes and studies and speaks on uh, not only art, but neuroscience, psychoanalysis, philosophy, and literature a woman of many talents, and I am extremely proud and happy that she's graced us tonight with her presence at FIT. Siri. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Patrick, for that very nice introduction. Um, you always feel a little alienated from yourself in those introductions, but in a kind of nice way. Um, so, no pictures, uh, which is maybe a little odd because I'm talking about art, but um, I have uh, a text 
and uh, I'm going to read to you just a little bit from a book as well. A couple of years ago, I gave a series of lectures at the University of Tübingen in German, Germany, and while I was there, I was taken to a museum that exhibited archaeological finds from the Vogelherd Cave in Swabia. Inside illuminated display cases, I saw tiny mammoths, lions, bears, and horses sculpted in ivory, and I developed an immediate affection for the single hedgehog among them. The animals are between 30 and 40,000 years old. In 2009, I saw the image of a bison deep inside a cave in Niaux in southwestern France. The eyes of that painted beast were so alive, they have never left me. Compared to the hedgehog, the bison is a youngster, a mere 12,000 years old. Long before human beings debated definitions of art, long before they collected it or visited museums to see it, they represented their worlds visually in figurative paintings and sculptures. Archaeologists believe that these objects served ritual and sacred functions, but the specific habits and beliefs of these vanished cultures remain mostly mysterious to us. The reason for my foray into hedgehogs and bison is to frame the question of art representation and perception broadly, to make it clear as forcefully as I can that despite evidence to the contrary, it helps for us to think of art beyond galleries, collectors, museums, and vast sums of money. Human beings are driven to symbolize their experience in ways other animals are not. The symbolization varies from place to place, culture to culture, and yet I, now a 21st century person, had no difficulty recognizing either hedgehog or bison, which is not to say their meaning for me was the same as the meaning they had for their makers, but rather to note that the figures conjure a likeness to animals I have seen in my own world. Such resemblance does not occur in language. If I don't speak English, the word hedgehog will not summon the animal, the word, the word hedgehog uh, will not summon the animal to mind. If I don't know a language, I am lost in a swirl of sounds or stare down at a page of alien characters. Visual representations are different from linguistic signs. I'm always amazed by the fact that written language is only 5,500 years old, much, much younger than the hedgehog and the bison. People were sculpting, painting, and dreaming long before they were writing. Whether a person is literate or not, she also hallucinates through the night, producing original visual creations often taken from what Sigmund Freud called day's residues, bits and pieces from the preceding day that are then transformed into imagery without her permission. Although they come from us, dreams are involuntary. In English, we say, I have a dream. In French, je fais un rêve, I make a dream. Dreaming is still largely mysterious. Theories have come and go. Some are better than others, in my opinion. But there is a profound connection between dreaming and making art. I have often thought that when I am writing fiction, it is a form of dreaming while awake. Involuntary processes are crucial in making art. There's no theoretical agreement about what art is. But I strongly resist the fantasy, reinforced by romanticism and reified by modernism, a fantasy still with us that Western art has been largely the activity of an autonomous, prodigiously gifted male artist, inevitably white, anointed by art historians and museum culture, and then neatly placed within the grand narrative of canonical aesthetic greatness. Aside from its obvious biases, this view has robbed artistic practice of its embodied vitality, its rhythms, breath, and heartbeat. 
It has obscured its relationship to ordinary life, to children's play, and the many forms of human creativity, which include everything from a child's mud pie and elaborate pretend games to ingenious repair strategies for a car engine, pillow embroidery, dress design, an elegant formula in physics, as well as works of literature, music, and visual art. In Art as Experience, the American philosopher John Dewey argues that the chasm between ordinary and aesthetic experience has led, philosophies of, led to philosophies of art that, quote, located in a region inhabited by no other creature and emphasized beyond all reason the merely contemplative experience of the aesthetic, end quote. This prejudice continues to have a hold on us, although it is certainly being challenged. Dewey was interested in art as an activity of embodied selves, an activity he linked to the diurnal rhythms of day and night, to waking and sleeping, and to the beat of human interactions with others and the world. The split between mind and body, thinking and feeling, has infected Western culture since the Greeks. It remains with us in multiple forms, and I've discovered it is very hard to get people to think beyond it. Further, the split between mind and body acquired an association to gender. The masculine is mind and thought. The feminine is body and emotion. We continue to split the world in two. Mathematics is masculine, but Poetry is feminine. The arts in general are coded as feminine, which can make it all the more important in our culture to stamp a work of art with masculine authority. But let us be clear, every person is a natural being. We are, as the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, called us, body subjects. We are thinking bodies. Unlike bacteria that develop and cooperate and fight to survive by wholly unconscious mechanisms, we are able to imagine ourselves as others see us, to reflect on ourselves as people among other people. We have reflective self-consciousness. There would be no art or design without it. In order to represent something, hedgehog or person, you are moving from the immediate world of your perception into an alternative world of symbols. Every time you take a photo of yourself, for example, and post it for your friends, you are demonstrating your reflective self-consciousness. You have to be able to imagine yourself as an object to yourself, a person seen through the eyes of others who imagines how that image of you will be received. This does not mean, however, that unconscious forces are not also at work while you are working on a project or even posting a picture. The artist has his problems and he thinks as he works, Dewey wrote, but his thought is more immediately embodied in the object, end quote. This is a profound remark, one that expresses the strange truth of art making and acknowledges that things happen while the process is underway, that are not readily explicable to the artist herself, but instead rely on her deeply felt sense of rightness and wrongness, a sense dependent on both her emotional history and her hard-won training and skill. I have phrased the same thought in another, perhaps more radical way, to account for what happens in my own writing. The book knows more than I do. As I have also argued in an essay called Why One Story and Not Another, how do I know that at this moment in the story, in the narrative, one character must smash another character over the head? Why do I feel and seem to know what is right and what is wrong? What is actually guiding those decisions? After all, a writer of fiction or a sculptor or painter, can do anything she wants. Everything is possible. Dewey didn't believe that art could be reduced to biology, nor did he believe that an artist could be lifted out of her or his environment. But rather that art is the product of the myriad relations of a human being embedded in her or his world. 
Suzanne Langer, another visionary American philosopher, wrote, art is the creation of forms symbolic of human feeling, end quote. And feeling is never static. It is rhythmical, shifting, and dynamic. The person who carved the hedgehog and the person who painted the bison both saw and felt the animal's living presence. Representations of a jumping frog, a sniffing dog, a bison stopped for a moment in a field, an alert blinking falcon, or a bristling hedgehog require the artist to look closely at and feel the animal's quickening movements in order to render the creature itself. And that looking, feeling, and rendering are not purely questions of conscious measurement, scale, and analysis, although these are no doubt involved. The exercise of representation is one that moves back and forth between the artist's body and the creature's body, between two living beings. Art is made in the between. I like to draw. It gives me pleasure. This must be true of quite a few of you who no doubt have far more sophisticated skills than I do. I do know, however, that when I draw something or someone, I always feel that my gesture on the paper is a way of touching the object or person. I'm caressing the other's form through my own rhythmic reality. It is a virtual touch of the other person or thing, and through that silent, tactile dialogue, a third thing, the drawing emerges. Art is always relational, always involves the artist in relation to otherness, and the artwork is always a gift for other people. Why else would anyone do it? It is part of collective life because we are social animals dependent on others to become what we are. Neglect, mistreatment, and isolation affect all social animals. We are not alone in this. If you isolate a prairie vole from her social world, neurogenesis stops. The animal stops generating new neurons. A brain, human or prairie vole, is not static but constantly changing, and its dynamism is dependent on the animal's experiences. This does not mean we or prairie voles are infinitely malleable, that we are only made of our experience, that we are purely social constructions. We are creatures limited by the physiology we are born to, but that same physiology is also continually changing in light of what happens to us. Newborns are not able to imagine themselves as others see them. They cannot recognize themselves in the mirror or represent themselves to themselves in a drawing or in words. All of that comes later. But infants as young as 45 minutes old can imitate the facial expressions of an adult. We are born imitators. Exactly what this capacity means is the subject of some controversy, but it suggests at the very least that we are bound up with other people's faces from the beginning of our postnatal lives. Imitation or mirroring is no doubt part of the foundation for what becomes imagination. Mirror neurons, some of you may know about this, were discovered by accident in the early 90s. The scientists on the team in Parma, Italy, realized that the same neurons fired in a monkey who grabbed a banana and in another monkey who just watched his fellow monkey grab the banana. The presence of mirror systems in human beings has further confirmed that we have a physiological capacity to reflect movements, expressions, and feelings of other human beings. This does not mean, of course, that because we mirror others, we are always empathetic or kind. Mirroring does not eliminate tribalism or prejudice. Learned patterns of behavior curtail us in many ways. Rather, it suggests that human beings appear to be built to grow into full-blown imagining adults. The imagination is precisely the faculty that allows a person to remember himself in the past in mental pictures, not identical 
to actual past experience, but vital to our lives nevertheless. The imagination is also the faculty that allows a person to fantasize about herself in a future that does not exist, or to imagine being another person in another life. When I say I, I represent myself to myself in language. I alienate myself in the word. It stands in for me. In order to paint or sculpt or write about another being well, real or fictive, the artist must imaginatively feel, enter, touch, and vicariously experience that other being. But she must also have the ability to alienate the creature in a representation. A picture or sculpture or film or photograph of a hedgehog is not a hedgehog after all. The drawing, the painting, the sculpture, the conceptual work, the installation, the video, the dress, the poster are imbued with the embodied meanings of the artist or maker within the broader cultural context in which the thing exists. The spectator, wearer, or consumer enters into a relationship with the work too. And this is where things get complicated. Despite the fact, for example, that I recognize both bison and hedgehog for the animals they are, and I feel in them the traces of a fellow human being, the meanings they have for me are dependent on my world, my past, my prejudices, my learning, my modes of framing what I am looking at, much of which is unconscious. Perception is not an incorporation of the real world into the person who is doing the perceiving. We don't just take in what is out there as if we were multi-sensory high-tech recording devices. Perception is creative. We both absorb the world out there and we make it. And we do this through patterns of memory implicit and explicit, in other words, unconscious and conscious, which create expectations that shape what we see. We often see what we expect to see. This is very important to understand. The active character of perception has become increasingly clear in both neuroscientific and psychological research. A couple of simple examples will help clarify what I mean. One study found that people remember an artwork by a famous artist as physically larger than one by an obscure artist, even if the two are exactly the same size. Another study confirmed what most of us already know. A painting hanging in a museum is received differently from the same painting sitting on a sidewalk. The sidewalk painting loses in this game. People will walk right by it. Certain names, Da Vinci, Rembrandt, Picasso, are so laden with historical superlatives they can blind us to the work itself. In fashion, it's just the same thing. People often pay for the name, even if the workmanship is not up to snuff. The name Chanel or Balenciaga carries along with it an idea of stature that enhances the wearer. This stature depends on the imaginary. It depends on the buyer imagining what others see when they see her. A woman imagines the envy of her fellow pedestrians as she saunters down the street carrying her Chanel bag. The power of envy should not be underestimated. The French thinker René Girard made much of this in his theory of mimetic desire. People want what other people have simply because they have it. Anyone who has looked at small children has noticed the following little narrative play out. A stuffed dog lies neglected on the floor. A child picks it up and begins to play happily with it. Another child watches her. Suddenly, he is overcome by a need to play with that dog. He rushes over, forcibly seizes the, do seizes the dog, and a fracas ensues. Some works of art, the Mona Lisa, for example, are so heavily coated with greatness and various later ironies, her famous mustache, that it is hard to know what the picture actually is or what it means anymore. 
Anything touted as the biggest, the greatest, and the best begins to collapse under the weight of those superlatives, um, and it loses rather than gains meaning. This is, has become a problem, this is an aside, for our psychopathic president whose grandiosity seemingly knows no bounds. But back to the Mona Lisa. Its priceless status creates expectations that will inevitably alter the viewer's physiological experience itself. In my most recent collection of essays of women looking at men looking at women, I included a piece called Balloon Magic, which brings us to another animal, Jeff Koons's Balloon Dog Orange, which sold for $58.4 million. The essay is an investigation into value and the art market and how we should understand the willingness of some people to part with sums of money that strike others of us as astronomical, even bizarre. In that essay, I cite an experiment done in California in which the scientists told the participants in their study that the same glass of wine came from either a $100 or a $10 bottle. Everyone in the study thought the wine from the $100 bottle tasted better. But more interesting is the fact that the brain scans of the two groups were markedly different. Same wine, different scans. To be crude about the neurobiology, reward areas in the brain were activated by the purportedly expensive bottle, but not by the purportedly cheap one. Reward feels good. It is a word often used in addiction research. People become addicted because they like the feeling the substance or the activity brings them, whether it's an opioid or gambling. The expectation of drinking a superior wine made the wine literally taste better. In other words, expectation created by context is part of your physical experience, whether you are drinking wine, buying an expensive dress, or paying $58.4 million for balloon dog orange. Because human beings see the world through expectation and prediction, our perceptions are inherently biased. That is, we have a strong tendency to perceive what is happening through what we already know. That knowledge, however, is not necessarily conscious. We are always seeing the world through stereotypes that have accumulated over time. I like to use the fictional example, to, this is a fictional example to illustrate my point. A beautiful young woman is at a party. She is wearing a low cut cocktail dress and has a glass of champagne in her hand. Let's make her a woman of color, just to complicate it. She is laughing and talking in an animated way with a companion as two people across the room are watching her. These two imaginary people could be two men or a man and a woman or two women, and they could be from just about any background. One of those imaginary persons looks at the other imaginary person and says, you mean that gorgeous girl over there is working on her second postdoc in molecular biology at Rockefeller? What a surprise. Science is still mostly male and mostly white. Add beauty to the equation and that changes the picture too. Beauty is almost always an advantage in life for all genders. For women in fields that are tra traditionally understood as masculine, however, it's a handicap. Let me reiterate, not one of us is immune to stereotypes. They are built into perceptions. A woman's work is received differently from a man's work, a black artist differently from a white artist. As Simone de Beauvoir argued in The Second Sex long ago in 1949, the universal is still male. In the United States, it is also still white. There are artists and then there are women artists and black and brown and gay and trans and disabled artists and what have you, other artists. It is crucial that we begin to free ourselves from the strangling perceptual biases of racism and misogyny and a host of other expectations, many of which are unconscious.
The only way to do this is to be conscious of what we are not conscious of, to detect the patterns that are biasing us towards certain judgments, to ask ourselves why on earth it was so surprising that the lovely young woman across the room was working on her second postdoc in molecular biology. When I was a young writer, years before Apple, years before everyone on the planet came to know that Siri was a woman's name, back in the early 80s, I received a number of rejection letters for poems and stories I had written that were addressed to Mr. Siri Houston. The literary editors, both male and female, may not have wanted Mr. Hustvet's work, but they wrote to him with a deference, respect, and encouragement that contrasted sharply with the dismissive, condescending rejections that were sent to Ms. Hustvet. This was a lesson in life, to be sure. It may have influenced a novel I wrote that was published in 2014 called The Blazing World about an artist, Harriet Burden, who feels her work has been neglected. It is a book about perception, art, and its biases. The book has an editor, I.V. Hess, who introduces us to the story. We never find out, by the way, whether this is a man or a woman. I will read you the first page of the book that sets up the stage for a pretty complicated dance of points of view. Editor's introduction. Quote, all intellectual and artistic endeavors, even jokes, ironies, and parodies, fare better in the mind of the crowd when the crowd knows that somewhere behind the great work or the great spoof, it can locate a cock and a pair of balls, end quote. In 2003, I ran across this provocative sentence in a letter to the editor that was published in an issue of The Open Eye, an interdisciplinary journal I had been reading faithfully for several years. The letter's author, Richard Brickman, did not write the sentence. He was quoting an artist whose name I had never seen in print before, Harriet Burden. Brickman claimed that Burden had written him a long letter about a project she wanted him to make public. Although Burden had exhibited her work in New York City in the 1970s and 80s, she had been disappointed by its reception and had withdrawn from the art world altogether. Sometime in the late 90s, she began an experiment that took her five years to complete. According to Brickman, Burden engaged three men to act as fronts for her own creative work. Three solo shows in three New York galleries attributed to Anton Tisch, 1998, Phineas Q. Eldridge, 2002, and the artist known only as Rune, 2003, had actually been made by Burden. She titled the project as a whole, Maskings, and declared that it was meant not only to expose the anti-female bias of the art world, but to uncover the complex workings of human perception and how unconscious ideas about gender, race, and celebrity influence a viewer's understanding of a given work of art. But Brickman went further. He argued that Burden insisted that the pseudonym she adopted change the character of the art she made. In other words, the man she used as a mask played a role in the kind of art she produced. Quote, each artist's mask became for Burden a poetized personality, a visual elaboration of a hermaphroditic self, which cannot be said to belong to either her or to the mask, but to a mingled reality created between them, end quote. As a professor of aesthetics, I was immediately fascinated by the project for its ambition, but also for its philosophical complexity and sophistication. There's a lot more of that beginning, but okay. What are these masks, and what is this hermaphroditic self? Does art have a gender or a color or some other feature that can be linked to the author or maker? The editors, the editors who wrote back to Mr. Siri Hustvet obviously did not detect in my work some essential femininity that advertised my sex. A young male writer once said to me, you write like a man. He meant this as a compliment. I did not take it as one. 
There are 19 narrators in the blazing world. Not a single one of them was taken from an actual person in the so-called real world, although many people have assumed that I must have had models in mind. Further, I am not any of the characters, although for years, interviewers have been telling me that my work is autobiographical. One of the problems with sexism and the way it colors our perceptions is that work by women is inevitably viewed as more personal, more autobiographical, more emotionally driven than works by men and is denigrated accordingly. On the other hand, when work by men is personal, autobiographical, and emotional, it is heralded as sensitive and brave. How can we escape these traps? If art is understood as territorial, read exclusively through the artist's sex or narrow cultural identity, then the larger argument appears to be that the imagination either doesn't exist or it must be strictly regulated. No artist is supernatural. Every artist is situated in a particular place at a particular time. We are all limited by our own experiences and must pay close attention to what it means to be a man or a woman or white or black or brown in a virulently misogynistic, racist, and xenophobic country. We must learn to be conscious of what is often hidden from ourselves. No one's imagination is wholly free. I would not write a book about a Nigerian accountant as my hero. I know too little about both Nigeria and accounting to pull it off. But I have written two novels in the voices of men, and in the blazing world, one of Harry's masks and one of my narrators is a biracial gay man. I don't know exactly where he came from, but I love him, and I certainly claim the right to have imagined him. This is just a brief passage from this person. Phineas Q. Eldridge, Oscar Wilde once said, man is, at, man is least himself when he talks in his own person. Give him a mask and he will tell you the truth, end quote. I played Harriet Burden's mask briefly and I do not regret it for a second. From behind my nearsighted mulatto queer self, she was able to tell the truth. In the gay world, disguise has a long history, which has never been simple. So when Harry asked me to beard for her, it felt as if I were merely tying an extra knot in a very old rope. I am a performer, and I know that my face on stage can often be more intimate and more honest than the one I wear in the wings. But I have also had two identities off stage. In 1995, I slithered out of my first persona, the one I was born with, to become my second self, Phineas Q. Eldridge. The person who preceded PQE, John Whittier, was a good boy, well-behaved if a little dreamy, kind to animals, girls, and poor people, in that order, easily frightened, and to use my mother's word, delicate. I had my first seizure when I was four years old and my last one when I was 13. The doctor said I outgrew them. They belonged to my earlier, shorter, prepubescent body, the one we all shed, along with small jackets and pants and shirts and shoes that once fit perfectly. We must be subtle, careful, thoughtful about art. We must be alert to its many meanings. Often they escape us. In fact, my most beloved works of art are the ones I don't fully understand. That is their magic, their secret, why I return to them again and again. We must seek to avoid the preordained categories of our immediate cultural reality that force us to see only what we expect to see. They threaten to suffocate art in one way or another. Whether it is the automatic denigration of works by women and people of color or political ideas that pinch the imagination. I honestly believe it is urgent for human beings to loosen rather than restrict boundaries that limit every person. Art is always a delicate dance into others, a crossing of borders, an imaginative movement into other terrain. Good art helps us to see, enter, and become what is foreign to us. It is not there to reinforce 
our perceptual stereotypes and cliches. I'm going to read you one other last passage that was, of course, perfectly marked in my old world. Here it is. This is Harriet Bruden, the, the person who has the maskings. It's from Notebook M. I am going to build a house woman. She will have an inside and an outside so that we can walk in and out of her. I am drawing her drawing and thinking about her form. She must be large and she must be a difficult woman. But she cannot be a natural horror or a fantasy creature with a vagina dentata. She cannot be a Picasso or a de Kooning monster or Madonna. No either or for this woman. No, she must be true. She must have a head as important as her tail. And there will be characters inside that head, little men and women up to various pursuits. Let them write and sing and play instruments and dance and read very long speeches that put us all to sleep. Let her be my lady contemplation in honor of Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, the 17th century monstrosity female intellectual. This, she's really around, guys. You can find her work. Author of plays, romances, poems, letters, natural philosophy, and a utopian fiction, The Blazing World. I will call my woman The Blazing World after the Duchess. Anti-Cartesian in the long run, anti-Atomist, anti-Hobbesian, an exiled royalist in France, but she was a hard-bitten monist and a materialist who didn't, couldn't quite leave God out of it. Mad Madge was an embarrassment, a flamboyant boil on the face of nature. She made a spectacle of herself, allowed once as a visitor to the Royal Society to watch experiments in 1666. The Duchess, in all her eccentric glory, was duly recorded by Samuel Pepys, who recorded everything. He called her a mad, conceited, ridiculous woman. It was easy. It's still easy. You simply refuse to answer the woman. You don't engage in a dialogue. You let her words or her pictures die. You turn your head away. Centuries pass. The first year the woman of the first woman the fir, the year the first woman was admitted to the Royal Society, 1945. The Duchess sometimes wore men's clothes, vests and cavalier hats. She bowed rather than curtsied. She was a beardless astonishment, a confusion of roles. She staged herself as mask or mask, M-A-S-Q-U-E. Cavalier hat off to you, Duchess. May its plumage wave. Cross-dressers run rampant in Cavendish. How else can a lady gallop into the world? How else can she be heard? She must become a man, or she must leave this world, or she must leave her body, her mean-born body, and blaze. The Duchess is a dreamer. Her characters wield their contradictory words like banners. She cannot decide. Polyphony is the only route to understanding, hermaphroditic polyphony. What noble mind can suffer a base servitude without rebellious passions, asks Lady Ward. But the ladies always win in her worlds through marriage, beauty, argument, and rank, wishful fantasy. Is this not what I want? Look at my work, look and see how to live a life in the world or a world in the head, to be seen and recognized outside or to hide and think inside, actor or hermit, which is it? She wanted both, to be inside and outside, to ponder and to leap. She was painfully shy and suffered from melancholia, a drag on her gait. She bragged, she adored her husband. A few sages called her a genius. I am a riot an opera, a menace. I am Mad Madge, Mad Hatter Harriet, a hideous anomaly who lives at the Heartbreak Hotel near Sunny's Bar on the water in Brooklyn with people straight from the funny papers. 
Bruno says there are those in the neighborhood who call me the witch. I take it on then. The enchantment of magic and the power of night, which is procreative, fertile, wet. Isn't that where their fear lies? Don't women give birth? Don't we push those squalling babes into the world, suckle them and sing to them? Are we not the makers and shakers of generations? Tiny Gulliver in Brob Dingnag looks up at the giant nurse who gives suck to an infant. Quote, no sight disgusted me so much as her monstrous breast. Its size is alarming and every imperfection of the skin visible. End quote. A Swiftian conflation of microscope and misogyny. But isn't every infant a dwarf at the breast? I want to blaze and rumble and roar. I want to hide and weep and hold on to my mother. But so do we all. <laughs> we find ourselves now in the grip of a mad spectacle of power, a hyper-white, hyper-masculine reality show that is endlessly talked and written about, but which it seems to me is rarely understood with anything close to what is called for under the circumstances. And it did not begin in 2016 with the election of a malignant narcissist. If anything, this president has demonstrated what desperate, paranoid, white masculinity looks like stark naked. If it weren't so dangerous, we could all laugh ourselves sick with its absurdities. Lock her up. Build a wall. Are the chants of those people who have become dimly conscious of what was once a wholly unconscious perceptual habit. If you were white and of the male sex, you were on top. No need to think about it. This also meant that you were automatically allowed to look down on those who weren't born white or male and no one censured your articulated contempt for those others. The legions of Trump voters I have heard on TV or in print saying that they voted for the man because he is refreshingly honest, he speaks his mind, he says what he thinks is a code for we are sick and tired of hiding our prejudices. It is no accident that backlash elevated this particular personality into the White House. The personality disorder on view, variously called psychopathy, sociopathy, antisocial personality disorder, or malignant narcissism, is embodied in the person who lacks all empathy and guilt, who is a pathological liar, who views the other purely as a tool in a game of aggrandizing the self, and more significantly, who lacks impulse control because he lacks imagination. If you can't imagine yourself tomorrow, you will not temper your actions today. Every perceived slight calls for an immediate reaction. What is fascinating to me is not that such people exist, but rather that viewing a president with this disorder exposes an ideology that suffers from precisely the same deficits. It necessitates a concept conception of the world as one of absolute hierarchies and borders that must be maintained at all costs. There is no imaginative movement into the other here. Whether that other is a hedgehog or a woman or another human being who is in one way or another different from you. Indeed, border walls are needed to shore up the white male body politic from feminine and brown intruders, pollutants that may demonstrate your own terrible vulnerability to humiliation. The sad fact that you, just as everyone else was once born, was once a helpless, wailing baby dependent on others to survive. The answer is not to erect ever more stiffening categories or to cling for dear life to cultural identities, although these are surely important to recognize. If one doesn't understand the larger reality and one's place in it, it is impossible to struggle against those defining limits and the perceptual habits that come with them. Certainly the pathetic declarations of those who admire Trump's honesty demonstrates, demonstrate what the French call mes connaissances, 
bad faith, a failure to see where he or she fits into the larger societal drama. I am arguing here for a position of complexity and imagination, of the value of fluid borders in all the arts, arts which do not reinforce stereotypes but dismantle them, arts that surprise us. A perspective of 40,000 years is sometimes helpful. I really don't know what the person who carved that hedgehog was thinking about, nor can I frame that small sculpture through that person's eyes, but she or he was doing something we are still doing today, representing our world in works of art that pull us into otherness and remind us that we too are social animals dependent on others for our survival. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Very grateful. Um, <clears throat> you know that um, it's probably not true here, but especially when I lec lecture um, on science, I notice that um, the first three questions always come from men. And, uh, and so when I am in the audience at such lectures, I always make a point of asking the first question just to break the barrier. So I'm trying to break it for you. There, there, right there, yeah. I just wanna say that your words are truly inspiring and not just in the sense like inspiring, just saying it, but I truly felt something during that hour when you were speaking, and I'm really grateful to be here oh, today. Oh, very nice of you. Um, if you had to tell your 20-year-old artist self, you know, as a woman, and I'm 20 years old, and I'm an artist at FIT, what would you, like, I don't even know how to ask this, but what would you tell her? Oh, I, this is really a good question. I mean, someone, I, I think it was the Guardian newspaper, you know, they ask you all these sort of jokey questions to different people. One of them was, you know, what, what do you regret? And um, uh, I think that the old self regrets how incredibly tolerant the young self was with jerks and creeps, you know, who, condescended and, 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 and treated you as, uh, you know, deeply unequal interlocutor when in fact you knew perfectly well you were not. Um, so my advice is uh, in part, um, you, you don't have to be, you don't have to be nice to people who are clearly aggressive and want to hurt you, right? I mean, I was a really polite girl from Minnesota and it was extremely hard for me to learn how to bite back when it was necessary. Induce a little fear. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to induce fear, no. So I listen to a lot of talk shows during the day and they're often interviewing artists and musicians and writers, and they often talk about, well, this, in, in the case of writing, well, this character appeared, yeah. and, and then that character did so-and-so, and that is why they had to do so-and-so. Yes, exactly. And I thought, but you're making that up, as I make up my paintings. So I'm wondering, can you comment on the idea that at a certain point, the work takes over? Yeah. Do you think that's true? Uh, I in my experience, it is true, and of course I can't speak for all other writers, but um, usually later rather than earlier in a book, you know, when you're, you're trying to set the tone. Um, but yes, I, I, I think it's something I'm very interested in. Um, you know, who's writing, right? Who's writing? Uh, because it, it feels as if the words are being given. And this is not my experience alone. There are many writers who have talked about that, almost hearing a kind of dictation. And it just rolls out of you. And this is clearly, I think, about emotional and unconscious, you know, uh, uh, presences that 
that artists tap into, and I think visual artists and musicians, um, all artists, but I also, by the way, I don't think this, that scientists also do this. You know, there, um, I have a physicist friend um, who is working and working and working for weeks and weeks and weeks on a formula. Hmm? And he went to sleep, and he had this dream about these two brothers, A and B, who were in mortal combat. And, um, you know, it was a very vivid dream. He woke up and, you know, with this crazy A and B dream in his mind, he sat down his, at his desk. He looked at the page and he saw it. He saw the problem. He, he did the formula. So creativity is not only in the arts either. I think it's all forms of creative work. And whatever that is that's happening is, is not, you know, consciously known to us. But a lot of, you know, a lot of what we know, say, as an artist, your years of experience as an artist are, are in you while you're working, even if you're not consciously making references to, to that experience. Uh, you speak of the power of envy. What are you envious of? <laughs> oh, I think uh, I think that, that I think envy. You know, this sort of triple thing that you want what people other ha have. I mean, you know, I think. Oh, I could quote a wonderful thing, Louise Bourgeois, the wonderful Louise Bourgeois, and uh, and and sometimes brutally honest. She said, "Artists are greedy." You know. You want one thing, then you know. See, you get sort of you get published. I mean, I'll do writers, right? You you send out your work. I mean, I talked about those rejection letters, and you just want to get published. That's all you care about, right? Then you get published. Then you want to get good reviews, right? Then you get some good reviews, and then you want the next thing. We're greedy, right? And in fact, in another essay, yes, it's in the uh, the most recent essay book, I talk about a certain grandiosity that is necessary for people to be artists. Because if you don't have it, you know, you can't get up again, right? I mean, there's a lot of slapping down and punching in, in, in the world of the arts, and it's the rare person, you know, who's anointed at, at 20, right? I mean, most of us spend a lot of time feeling hurt and rejected, but if you don't think I have something to say, you're going to leave, you know, you're going to get out of it. But so I think that's necessary and that is not about your talent. That's about some characterological resistance to the world. Oh. Here's someone, there's someone, is it? Yeah. Um. You said that you experience the book knowing more than you do. Um, how is that, is, do you ever get into your own head about it and then you have to like allow the book to kind of take power again? Yes, yeah, I think this is really for, you know, working artists, I think we're really getting into the working artist things because I'm now 63, I've been writing books for a very long time and um, one thing I have understood very deeply is that a state of profound relaxation is necessary for me to, to write. You know, that if I'm, I think this is what you're saying, if, um, well, it's, it's like if you're constipated, right? It's bad. And you can't, you know, get out what you need to get out. And that state of relaxation, even if it involves a certain kind of waiting, you know, and patience, and extreme openness uh, to, you know, whatever is there. I mean, it's some sort of inside-outside phenomenon. But yes, I think you can overthink. You know, I can sometimes look at poems or, or stories, and I can see all that intellectual labor that has been for naught. You know what I mean? It's like... You know, people who just want to make a work of art to make a work of art. You know, a poem for the sake to make a poem that sounds like other poems, that's like a real poem. And if that's what you're doing, then I think the urgency 
the beauty, the necessity that's always there in every good work of art is just gone. Hi, thanks Hi. so much for your talk. Um, I, I'm also like, it's sort of related to a previous question uh, about sort of, I'm a young writer too, and I find myself sometimes getting in the way of myself when I'm getting rejection letters from magazines or whatever. Yeah. And so as a, when you were a young writer, how did you get out of your own way? Sort of, because I feel like that sort of well, stifles creativity. It's true. These are two uh, sort of related questions, yeah. I think. And um, I, you know, when I was uh, in my early 20s and I was a graduate student at Columbia, I was writing poems all the time. And um, I finally wrote a poem I, I liked, and I sent it to the Paris Review, and they took it. I had many rejections, by the way, but that was like one of those magical things that sometimes happens in the world. But you know, after that, I got really stuck. And everything, you know, I would have like Wallace Stevens open on my desk, hoping that, you know, he would, you know, kind of send out the message. Um, and Emily Dickinson, you know, I had this, but, and, but I was really stuck. And I talked to um, a professor and a, and, and a poet, David Shapiro, and he said to me, Siri, you know, when that happens to me, I do automatic writing. I just sit down and let it go. You know, whatever comes out, don't care about it. And I sat down that same night and wrote 30 pages of prose, just to kind of wail, I guess. And I spent the next three months editing 30 pages down to 10. And, um, you know, I, I actually still like those 10 pages. So, and I think that was, it was a sort of release, you know. It's like, it's an exercise that can take you somewhere. Um, it's not that those 30 pages were publishable, but they were an opening to something that was. There's someone. You see her in the stripes? Right here. No, down. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll get you. <laughs> sorry. Um, as someone who has such a long history of engaging with art, um, are you ever concerned with the danger of your approach or perception becoming a little desensitized? Oh. You know what, you know, I, I, you know, when I was talking about, you know, our prejudices and the character perception and everything, um, I certainly do not exempt myself. And, um, you know, there are works of art that I've had, you know, I don't like that. And then later I've re-encountered the work, you know, and I think, what was wrong with me? Did I have a stomach ache or, you know, what was going on? One of the ways that I've found um, to, you know, to eliminate some of one's own prejudices is to spend a really long time in front of a work of art that interests you. And when I say a long time, I mean like a couple hours. So if you're in front of a work of art for a couple of hours, what happens is a lot of stuff starts to fall away. You know, the first thing is, you know, if it's representational, that's a tree, that's a horse. You know, it just kind of goes away. Uh, and you can begin to see parts of, say, a, a, a painting that you might never have looked at. You know, peripheral aspects of the painting. But time, I think time can counter those kinds of auto prejudices that we bring to, always bring with us, yeah. There. Hi. Hi, so in my class, I'm currently learning about the idea of the racial imaginary. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that the imagination isn't wholly free. And no. you also mentioned the complications that can arise when writing about perspectives that aren't necessarily your own. Yes. But you've also created a character who is biracial and gay. So I just wanted to know, how do you approach when writing about identities that don't belong to you? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think what I was trying to, uh, I don't know, to frame was that mixture of uh, care. I mean, when I mentioned the Nigerian accountant, you know, that's just not part of my experience. You know, I'd have to move to Nigeria, work really hard, and learn accounting, and that's not going to happen. Um, but, uh, you know, this character, Phineas, 
is much more part of a world that I've lived, right? So, so that it wasn't so hard for me to imagine him because I've had friends and known people in similar positions. He's, I have to say too, he's a middle class boy, you know, was now a, a, a young man. And, uh, and you know, that also brings him closer to me in some way. So, so I guess that form of engagement with the other, um, you know, the person that's not you, that's re that you have to move into, um, it's uh, sometimes, you know, there's reading and research and thinking that goes into it for me. Um, other times the people seem to appear and it's also that odd thing about feeling relaxed, like feeling good. I have made mistakes. I, I mean, I have had characters that I started and I realized they were kind of hackneyed. Um, I had this really actually, uh, in, in a, I had this recently working on a novel and I had this really brilliant um, uh, uh, black student who was a phenomenologist writing about Husserl and there was something wrong with him. I was not, I was not appropriately imagining him. And he, he left the book. Because I, I, I didn't feel good about how I was somehow managing that. And again, it's a kind of gut feeling, but I'm a, you know, I guess what I'm talking about is a kind of tenderness and also this deep recognition of where you are as a writer. I mean, you know, I keep saying uh, white people have to talk about whiteness. You know, this is a big, important conversation, not necessarily with black people, with other white people, right? To understand what that means, what we just have somehow not, you know, done. And, uh, you know, when you think about the, the legacy we're living with, you know, uh, this is really important. So again, it's some kind of balance of not restricting people's imaginations into some kind of tight fist, you know, that I, as a six foot tall, you know, blonde Lutheran girl from Minnesota can only have those characters in my books, right? Because I live in a world where I experience lots of people. Maybe inadequate, but I do the best I can. Yeah. <laughs> Do I need a mic? All right. Mm -hmm. I need a mic. Okay. How's that? I want to thank you so much oh, for that's being so here. Nice. We we're very honored that you're oh, here. I really you makes me feel very really special good. person and an important person. Although I don't know how you feel about my saying that, but I just want to say uh, for starters that your process of uh, letting go, uh, the, the intuitive process that you have as a writer, I think is very much understood by all of us who are artists and writers, yeah. professional artists and writers. The way that you have so beautifully stated it, I think we are all very grateful for because I think many of us have said this time and again to our students, just let go, let go, because uh, when you're learning, especially when you're collecting information, you're very accustomed to being in your analytical mind, and this is what people do. And you say, we, we've all been doing this for a long time, and so we know a lot of things. Easier to let go under those circumstances. Course, you know a lot of things, of you let go of everything, and then everything just comes to you. But for students, they're still collecting, and so when we say to them, let go, you know, get out of your analytical mind as, as much as you can, you know, let go, relax, relax. I think it's, it's not that easy for them to, they can understand the language, but to grasp, to actually become experiential with that is something that they're still yes, of learning course. how to do. Well, yes, as I said, I remember, you know, I kept thinking that maybe Emily Dickinson would just what you I know, want to say like is, come in. <laughs> listening to you, it was so beautifully stated that I think tonight people are, students are understanding 
more what we've all been talking about. I think you just stated the process so beautifully. Well, that's very nice, and I yes. thank you. And then just to say also that the analytical mind can come in handy too. Yeah, right, right. yes. I use it. Sorry, didn't, didn't no, no, mean to I, dismiss I, I'm just it. teasing, I I'm just teasing. It. But I think that yeah. kind of balance because, you know, certain things like editing, um, certain, uh, you know, I'm sure you have critiques here and everything, that it could allow you to see something with, you know, that observer self, right? So, sure. so we have that, right. So there's yeah. a kind of observer self. Every artist is also an observer. Right. And then that, you know, strange uh, underground, what this amazing guy in the 19th century, um, Myers called the subliminal self, which almost seems to be doing tremendous amounts of work without your really understanding it. Perfect. Um, oh, sorry. Since the election, I feel like for a lot of people, it kind of unmasked a lot of the hidden racism oh, yeah. and everyday kind of sexism. Mm -hmm. How do you think that this kind of, kind of, like, climate change will affect the art coming, art, music, fashion, pop culture, whatever, um, going into this new kind of post-Trump world we're living in? Yeah, well, you know, I think this is fascinating. I, I expect that there will be some really interesting art coming out of this. I mean, even at the, uh, the Whitney Biennial, um, this last one, you know, I saw some uh, work that was clearly politically driven, but it wasn't, you know, Ajit Prop. It wasn't like slogan work. You know, if you, if you look at a work of art and it's, it's like what I call a one-liner, usually not gonna, you know, <laughs> do that much. But some of the works in that show I thought were politically driven and, um, you know, made you think, you know, made you, woke you up a little bit. And uh, I, I, listen, I couldn't keep, you know, Trump out of my last novel. Uh, be, you know, it's just these things I think come in when you're real, when you really feel that, um, you're right, it's a kind of, it's as if aspects of the United States have been ripped open mm -hmm. and that we're looking at, not just now, right, but the whole history of, of, of slavery, of immigration, um, of, uh, uh, of Jim Crow, and now mass incarceration. I mean, we're, we're looking at this. And this is maybe, it's a horrible thing to say, but maybe, something this terrible has helped us do that, at least some of us, me included. Hello. Um, I am an artist and also used to write, I uh, should more. Um, I guess my question to you is how often are you writing? Like how important it is is it to you to literally sit down and kind of work that muscle? I mean, that, that schedule. Well, you probably don't want to hear that. I, I work seven days a week yeah. for hours. Mm -hmm. So I'm usually at my des desk at about seven, and then I work into the um, afternoon, like w one or two. Um, and then I read for four hours. This is what, you know an old lady like me can do this. I just, <laughs> I write and then I read. But, um, uh, so I think it's really important. It also helps with your, the relaxation problem, right? right? If you're avoiding your desk or, you know, anxious about it. But if it's just your job to yeah. write, you know, or you give yourself that place and you just do it. Yes, I think it helps the muscle a right. lot. Thanks. Thank you. It's okay if you're burned out. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You were lovely. <laughs> lovely.
Siri, thank you so much. And I just want to let everybody know our next Art Speak speakers are going to be the Gorilla Girls. And in a, a yeah, uh, in, a, in a wonderful moment of, dare I use the word, synergy, um, Siri has written about them recently, and you can find that article on her website. Um, it'll also be on a Wednesday night, Wednesday, May 2nd. The talk will start at 6. It's already uh, proven to be a popular event. Um, there's been a big uh, response to it on FIT social media. So we want to urge all the FIT students and faculty to get to the talk early. The talk will start at 6. The doors will open at 5. And so we're going to make sure that all FIT students get priority in faculty as well, but especially the students. Um, so thanks again, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.